It was a lot of chaos, a lot of unpredictability. I didn't really have any future in Vietnam and my parents made very sure that I understood that. It's time to escape right now before something bad happens. The message was clear, we have to get out of Vietnam. I was born in Lat Gia, which is the southern, um, southern city of Vietnam. Um, back then, I didn't know where I was, but when I speak with my younger brother, he said, you see where the end of the S is? That's where we are. The school over there is a little bit strange because they make, there's so much memorization that is unreal. I go home and I would have to read like five pages of poem about the country of Vietnam, of course, under the communist teaching. Um, just how great we are, how we beat up the American people. Every day, there's this sound off of the alarm that you have to stand and salute a dead guy, the Ho Chi Minh. And um, of course, none of that is relevant in my life. It was just more of a repetitious thing, and you do it just to get it over with. It was uh, a lot of chaos, a lot of um, unpredictability uh, in growing up. In my family, we have very, very dynamic conversation uh, during mealtime a lot about what's right, what's wrong regarding the war. They're all educated under the French system, and I was the only one that was educated under the American system, even in Vietnam. And so I was always defending. Eight, ten years old, I was crying, saying, you just don't understand what they're doing. My family called me their American kid. It wasn't passed on to us. Why? But we have to go. That's, that's truly the message was clear. We have to get out of Vietnam. Well, my family came here to escape the Vietnam War. We were actually all born in Laos, but you know, even Laos was being affected by the Vietnam War, so my parents knew sooner or later we had to get out of there. I remember one day I just came home and I see people in the neighborhood were saying, hey, they're getting your dad, they're getting your dad to prison. I probably was like five years old, six years old at that time. But I remember clearly that day, I chased after it, I tried to yank him back. The Viet Cong, we call, I call him, um, continued to push me away. And finally he just took me and threw me away so that they can continue to march him down the street into the prison cell that was about probably 15 minute walk from our house. He was in there for about close to 10 years. Not until 91, I believe, when America did some kind of contract with Vietnam. My mom sent a letter that my dad is being released and he's home. Uh, my father, actually, when he was going to medical school, he had to be in Hanoi because that's where the medical school was. It's a French university. At the time when he graduated, Ho Chi Minh was trying to fight the French and so my father joined the patriotic movement to fight the French. When he realized that it also was becoming communist, that's his departing point where he realized that he doesn't want to just get sucked into it. He uh, talked to uh, Ho Chi Minh about allowing him to go south under the pretext that it will help grow the movement. But then, uh, when President Johnson escalated the war in 1965, they moved all the contingents family out of Vietnam and they closed down the school. And some American missionaries came and, um, and, and did a very rack tack, you know, set up just for the few of us who are left there. The Viet Cong would just shell rockets randomly into Saigon, and uh, you never know when you'll get hit. One time, the rocket dropped right behind our house and killed two of our neighbors and shattered my grandfather's bedroom, which was the one closest to the neighbor's house. Luckily, he was okay. If it's just by one millimeter, I may not be sitting here talking to you. I escaped three times, four times actually, but the other one we just turned back so it doesn't count. 
have a younger brother, he was in the hand and we were in a fruit boat because we have to get out to the sea to catch a, a little bit bigger shrimping boat. So we get on that little canoe and left and all I hear was chaotic and yelling and screaming and we have to turn back. The other two was actually arrested. The fourth time is when we made it out. My parents were able to arrange for me to leave Vietnam to go to Paris where some of my brothers and sisters were already there going to college. I went to uh, France under the auspices uh, as to going to a convent. Uh, you can't just say you want to leave. You can't just do that. You know, they don't allow people to leave. So you have to have a place to go to. I did not graduate yet from high school. So with the help, assistance of the Archbishop in Vietnam, he arranged for some paperwork for me as if I was going to the convent, but it was pretty close. I went to a boarding school with the sisters, you know, the Marymount sisters. And it was just my junior and senior year that I was there. And so I knew that I didn't want to be in France. I wanted to come to the United States. So I, on my own, apply for colleges here. And that's how I got here. All the boys have to leave because by the time we reach teenage, we were sent over to Cambodia or Laos to fight in a guerrilla war. My mom doesn't want us to reach 10 or 12 to go because when you get up at that age, they really pay attention to you. If the opportunity arise, she will ship me and my brother out because my brother is two years older than me. The time that they, I was caught and was in prison the longest, I think it was a month. They put us into this big, large room. And I remember the guy kept asking, where are you going? Who is the captain? Where are the goal? And they would continuously interrogate the people. And then after that, we all go into a holding cell and just sit there and then they let the kids go. And we pretty much walk home the whole way. It was a, I would say probably three, four days. We live in the city, yeah and it has a landmark, um, kind of like a Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so when we were walking and he said, keep going, keep going, keep going. And when we see and knew that, we saw that monument, we ran. We literally just... It was, uh, it was joyful. Excitement. <sighs> we knew that we were going to see our mom again. So I talked my grandparents into making sure that I was able to go because it cost money. You know, I think a couple gold bars or something like that for, for the, the ability to get on a boat and, and, and be able to go. And my grandparents actually paid just for me because that's all they could afford. My mother planted this kind of like seed where we actually had a little pot of land that we farm at to grow our rice. But it really was kind of like an escape route that one night we we're gonna work there and like just go into the forest. She hired actually some smuggler. My parents are cobblers, they made shoes. So we hid a lot of money in the um, flip flops. Walking through near the ocean, it felt like quicksand. And that's the only little things I remember my dad carrying me. We all came together, eight girls and mom and dad. For me, it was just the opportunity to start something new that I knew that I didn't really have any future back um, in Vietnam. And my parents made very sure that I understood that. So it was actually, a, a, it was a very exciting um, thing. She hugged me and my brother. She said, you need to go to visit your grandma. Something happened. I knew we were leaving. And I had a feeling that it was, it was going to be her goodbye. And um, so we went on a little, um, this little um, bus. They took us down south, further south, which is it went, had to go past our house. And me and my brother just looked in there and I remember I look in the house and I say, I want to remember everything, <laughs> everything. We went into this little house and they grab us in, go inside this high into this little room behind some closet and my sister was in there. 
that is when I knew it was for real. One night, they say it's time and everybody stopped running and everybody packed up and ran. We were running so fast and so hard, the water just starting to get over my head. Uh, I remember there was a man that just grabbed me, um, pulled me up on top of him, and we just ran and threw me up on the little boat. I did remember smelling a lot of burnt rice because that's what they were able to cook and eat on the boat. It's a boat that can fit 20 people. I think there were 60 people there. Because I was relatively small and I was just throwing up all the place, they kind of put me just in a little corner. And even my aunt and uncle, they were seasick as well. So there was not much help during that whole time. I mean, you hear stories all the time when there's not enough food. I mean, the, the, the strong basically get it, and then whoever kind of challenged them will, you know, get pushed out. For me, luckily, I was just like in and out of consciousness most of the time, so that, that actually helped, helped me in, 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 in my own survival, I guess. We're hoping that an oil tanker gets to you or any type of organization that helps refugees pick you up before the pirates, before the communists, and before you run out of food or before you capsize. So the odds of that is not that high. When we got somewhere, I can hear people calling land, land, duck, call duck, just land. Everybody was happy. I want to be happy, but I don't know how to be happy. We had no money. Don't know where we're going. We don't know what's, what's ahead. There was, it was just empty. But I knew that we survived. That was the one conversation I had with my mom many times. Why? You know this, all this risk and uncertainty. She go, because it will be worse. I said, what can be worse than leaving your child and sending them out to the ocean? You got pirates, you got the weather, and there's no, nothing out there. And they said, it will be worse. And eventually, I, I learned, I read and I talk to people, and I learned and say, yes, it would be worse. I would become one of the communists and go kill people at a very young age. The line between safety and danger is really close because if you land in Cambodia, you will get killed and slaughtered. I, I pray that I never, ever, ever have to make this decision with my children. And I look back and I see she is a strong, strong woman that to have to make that choice. Both choices are going to be painful. But I remember that night, there was no emotion in her. Just a little sadness in the eye. We got picked up by an oil tanker. Um, and that was the first time that I was able to get on solid ground. I was, uh, I was literally, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because it felt so good. It was Thailand that we land. This town never seen people like us. They don't know who we are. They have never experienced boat people. They took us into this hall. Uh, it's kind of like an old building. It has different level. And they would choose as a corner, probably a 10 by 10 space for three of us. And uh, that's our life. There was some temporary schooling that was setting up. That's my uh, first grade and second grade. So we were there to close a year, and they moved us back to um, another place in Thailand, another camp. But I remember the joy that we're moving a step closer to getting out of there. So we moved to the next camp for uh, about four months. Then we get up and they're like, oh no, we're going to another country. We're like, wow, another one. And it's another camp. Uh, that was in Indonesia. 
Oh, that was a big step up because we have a shack now. And uh, we didn't have to go get water. That was the next luxury thing in, in our life. There was some schooling. I learned the basics of math, um, the basic readings of Vietnamese. We stayed there for an, probably another year. The last time that I left was about six and a half, almost seven. By the time I got to America, I was 10. We were actually in family prison camps. So it was separated between male and female. So we were actually very, I think, fortunate to be separated. And we were actually, this is the story my mom told me, surrounded by prostitutes that really cared for us because there was eight girls. Here's a mom with eight daughters. I think we were in the family prison camp for only for a week. Then somehow we got sponsored to go to like a refugee camp. and. It never felt like a prison. My mother actually started a candy little stall. It felt like, you know, this is your way to get out. So while you're here, just survive. Find a way to make a living and survive. You're in the refugee camp. I think we were there for almost a year. And when you're there, you're basically relying on the goodwill of the Philippines as well as the United States because the United States sent all kinds of supplies to help. During that time, they were asking for all kinds of people to sponsor family, kids, or really anywhere. So that's when like the Vietnamese population just went all over the place. Coming to the United States into the college campus, I didn't see I fit in as well because all the kids were anti-war and and uh, so that was something that I felt I always have to kind of like explain that, you know, we want to get rid of the communists. Even though that, you know, my story sounds like a long time, there are much less fortunate people. Some people stay there for five years, four years at the same place. So because we have family here and my sister was willing to sponsor and did the paperwork and everything, uh, we get to leave. To, to us, it was a good time. We got on a plane. Oh my God, that was amazing. All kinds of churches kind of just came in and just say, you know what, I don't, we don't know the family, we're gonna sponsor them. We'll set them up for, you know, six months, get them on their feet, make sure they are able to work, and then they back out. To me, it was just, it's just unreal. It's unfortunate that we don't do that kind of stuff enough anymore, but I'm, I'm glad that it happened during that time for sure. You know, I think my creative side is coming from my mother. She knitted eight sweaters for us, red hot sweater, cable knit, turtleneck, heavy wool. And because we thought America was going to be super cold, no one told us we're going to Texas and Houston, Texas. And so when we got on the plane, we landed, we're like, oh my God, it's so hot. We landed in Houston in August. <laughs> we had all these things on. <laughs> I, I was looking at this picture and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> It was such a more welcoming environment in Houston. My ESL class teacher were amazing. The students were so much more welcoming. So I felt very, very welcome in Houston. The first time I get to see my sister, because I don't remember my sister. I don't remember my older brothers. They have about 10, 12, 14 years ahead of me. Everything was just so amazing. They drive down the freeway. They drove to Houston skyscraper. Wow, that was something. I, I couldn't see the top of the building. That I, I remember, I said, man, I don't know, maybe God is up there. I think we, we, we had the right attitude of study, study, study. That's my job, that's all I'm here to do. So that's what I did. It just so happened I graduated in 75. And now I'm a person with no country and I have no green card and my student visa already expired. And so I went to apply for a job. They realized that I don't have a green card. Uh, they couldn't hire me because of the federal grants that they get. Suddenly I became even more scared because suddenly they classified me, the INS, as a deportable alien. And that means I could be, get kicked out any minute, any day. You know, that, this is 1976. Just to know that you don't belong to any country, even with a green card, 
I don't have any country because Vietnam now would not recognize me. It's it's un, unhinging feeling. When I got to college, I didn't realize that my childhood was not normal. So believe it or not, I went to UT and then I was telling my friends about, you know, that experience of like not able to eat for like two weeks on a boat because I was seasick. And they were just like, you went through that? And I was like, you guys didn't? I thought everyone did because my cousin did, my brother did, everyone I knew did. Thank God there was a Vietnamese um, environment and little section of the Vietnamese culture here in downtown, Kimson Restaurant. And before downtown was developed, there was, you know, a few grocery store there. And during New Year's Eve, we went there for celebration. Um, we went to Vietnamese church. So, and then, you know, our family members are all Vietnamese. We were definitely growing up was still surrounded by Vietnamese people, family members. So even in school, there was a sprinkle of us. So you never felt alone. It was a new fight. Uh, we get picked on. Boat people, uh, they call us far FOB, fresh off the boat. Of course, whoever calls us that, we get into a fight. Uh, we don't like it, we hated it. That now I become, as an adult, to accept and be proud of it. We grew up working, like literally from junior high on. Like, we were entrepreneurs in sixth grade. Like, we were at the flea market making shish kebab. But that made me realize how amazing the American dream is. I become much more open-minded, and uh, I also believe that everyone have a need to do well. And I think it's the difference is how do you go about doing it? The pressure to be doctors and lawyers are still very strong in our culture because that is the stamp of success. And I think me being in the spotlight shows that being in the arts is actually a viable and a way of being successful and you know showcasing that if you let me be who I am I'll show you I can still make you proud and I can still be successful but you know I always said if you're gonna you know come here to America let your children have the American dream. My work is not the typical work but it's a work that does mean something and I want to make sure that um, people are getting taken care of just like the way I was taken care of without even knowing who took care of me. But I, I do know there was a lot of people who took care of us. You really respect and see your parents' hard work coming here, and so you want to make them proud. Oh, so much of that. <laughs> so I think that's why you thrive. I'm just glad that I'm over here, and I'm just glad that those days are long gone there's an opportunity for me to do anything. What is that anything? And that's what I want to do for myself, do for my kids, and you know, hopefully one day someone will say, you know what, because you did that, I did this. And that's my contribution to um, the world, is that I've inspired someone not to, just settle for as is. I actually went down to Vietnam two and a half years ago to do Project One Way Vietnam. And it was the first time in my life that I actually was uh, able to be with my people for six weeks and really understand, you know, who I came from and what I came from. And to work with, you know, people that were born in Vietnam, the generation of them, the young, the old, and the new, and even with the Communist Party was quite interesting. So I actually realized being there that more woman oriented how powerful and how stubborn and how amazing the Vietnamese people were. We are very resilient people. Uh, we had to fight the Chinese for almost a thousand years. We had to fight the French for over a hundred years. And then with the, this war, so I think pe people sort of accept that it's a country that you always have to defend. We're pretty feisty, we're pretty persistent. Perseverance is in our DNA, I think. There's always going to be taller, someone taller, someone smarter, someone better looking than you, for 100% sure. But there's one thing that you can always outdo. It's work hard. Work harder than they, they will, and that's it. 
I think the best thing about being a Vietnamese here in Houston, or just for me, my personal experience, is that you don't see your race when you're surrounded by just kind people. You know, I think you don't see the barrier, so you can climb high. One day, I hope I can feed the whole story to my children. So they, they have a sense of what happened to their parents. I learned the true love, what it is, the sacrifice that you have to make. I'm proud and honored because I learned that millions have died. We are some of the people that made it.